All right, so we are on chapters 11 and 12 of WISH. Just getting it ready, one second. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> okay, uh, chapter 11. The next day at school, it seemed like the clock had stopped and the day was stuck in a never-ending torture of math and social studies and gym. Even lunch and recess were in slow motion. Finally, the dismissal bell rang, and I hightailed it to the bus. I plopped down in my usual spot and waited for Howard. He must have been taking his own sweet time because the seats were starting to fill up. The next thing I knew, Audrey Mitchell was making her way up the aisle, cutting her eyes from side to side, searching for a seat. I couldn't believe it when she sat next to me, propping her backpack between us so she wouldn't catch any of my cooties. You can't sit here, I said. She made an ugly face at me and said, yes, I can. No, you can't, I sort of hollered. She flinched a little and gaped at me. We can't, or you can't save seats, she said. That's the rule. Pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. But Howard's dumb trick didn't work because the next thing I knew, I had shoved her right off the seat and into the aisle. The minute I did it, I regretted it. Everybody liked Audrey. I ought to be bringing her candy bars and telling her how nice her hair looked instead of shoving her onto the dirty bus floor. Luckily, Audrey didn't have a temper like me and Scrappy. All she did was yelp a little bit, dust herself off, call me crazy, and move to another seat. By the time Howard finally got there, my temper had settled down from a boil to a simmer. He dropped into the seat next to me. What you fired up about now, he asked. I looked out the window so he couldn't see my still red face. I'm not fired up, I said. He pushed his glasses up on his nose and went, huh. Then he dug around in his backpack and pulled out half a cheese sandwich. He took the cheese out, rolled it into a ball, and popped it in his mouth. Then he did the same with the bread, rolling it into doughy balls. As the bus made its way through the streets of Colby, I thought about the trap we were going to make to catch wisp Wishbone, and my simmering anger disappeared. In its place was a swirl of excitement. When we got to Howard's, Mrs. Odom was on the porch with Cotton, smiling and waving to the bus driver. Howard, Dwight, and me sat on the porch steps while she asked about our day. Did Mrs. Willoughby finally get that window fan fixed? Was Dwight's math test hard? Did the PTA sell cupcakes in the cafeteria again? Then Howard whipped some papers out of his backpack and thrust them at her, grinning. Ta-da, he said. She made such a fuss over those papers, you would thought they were made of pure gold. I could practically feel my marked up papers jammed into the bottom of my backpack, weighing heavy on my lap. I wish I had a good one so I could say ta-da too. Howard didn't really need to be my backpack buddy anymore since I knew my way around school and I definitely knew the rules. Instead, he kept offering to help me with some of my schoolwork. I always said no, cause what was the use? I wasn't even gonna be at that school much longer, I reminded him. His face would droop and he'd say, you never know, you might be. I ignored that and stuffed my sorry looking papers into my backpack like I didn't even care one bit. But sitting on that porch with Mrs. Odom, I sort of wished I had let him help me some. After we had banana pudding for a snack, me and Howard went straight back to the ramshackle garage behind his house. I swear that garage looked like it was going to fall right over, tilting sideways with the door hanging off one hinge. We stepped inside and Howard's daddy looked up from his workbench in the corner. When he stood up, I thought his head was going to go right through the ceiling. He was so tall. He had a great big, er, he had great big freckled hands and fiery red hair and twinkly blue eyes. He smelled like grass and sawdust and gasoline all mixed together. Hey there, he said, and his big booming voice bounced around that little garage, practically shaking the saws and shovels right off the walls. I'd seen him at church, mopping his sweaty face and ha with a handkerchief while he belted out when the rule is called up yonder, but I never talked to him. While most folks were drinking coffee and chit-chatting in the fellowship hall, Mr. Odom and some of the other men were outside inspecting each other's truck engines or watching teenagers play basketball in the parking lot. Well, look at you, he said to me. You know, you are the spitting image of your mama. My mama? I hadn't expected that. I am? I asked. You sure are. You look just like her. 
You mean Bertha, I said. Nah, Carla, he said, your mama. You know her? Don't really know her, he said. Only seen her a time or two. In Rayleigh, you mean? Nah, up yonder at Gus and Bertha's. He brushed sawdust off the front of his shirt. Seems like just yesterday, but I reckon it wasn't, he said. Oh, was all I could think to say, but my mind was racing. When had Mama been at Gus and Bertha's? How come nobody would ever told me that? Old Howie here has been talking about you nonstop, he said, winking at Howard. I felt my cheeks burn. Then Mr. Odom said, so y'all gonna catch that mangy old hound, are you? Yes, sir. That mutt's a rascal, I can tell you that. Been chased away from every chicken coop and garbage can in Colby. His name is Wishbone, Howard said. Mr. Odom chuckled. Well, that's a fine name. He likes me, I said. Charlie's gonna keep him, Howard said, but we have to catch him first. So Mr. Odom showed us how to staple chicken wire to wood and how to screw on hinges for a door, and before long, we had a trap perfect for catching a dog. When Burl got home from his job pumping gas, he helped us load the trap into the back of his truck and drove us to Gus and Bertha's. My thoughts kept flitting around over, all over the place, sometimes thinking about Wishbone and sometimes thinking about Mama being up there at Gus and Bertha's. But Burl played the radio so loud, none of my flitting thoughts had a chance to settle down in one place. When we got to Gus and Bertha's, we set the trap up over by the bushes at the edge of the yard. While me and Howard gathered leaves and branches to stick through the chicken wire, Bertha kept Burl busy with all her questions. Did he think his mama would like some pickled okra from the garden when it was ready? Was Lenny still in the marching band? Had his grandmama had that hip surgery yet? Burl said, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Finally, me and Howard finished, and I swear, you couldn't hardly even see that trap nestled there in the bushes. I ran inside the house and got the pie tin of table scraps I'd been saving. A piece of bacon, a biscuit, some tuna nuda casserole. I pushed the tin or the pie tin way back into the corner of the trap and said, okay, now all we have to do is wait. So we're actually only going to read that chapter today because um, what I want you to do today is a little bit different than what you normally do for wish. So instead of answering questions, I'm going to have you write a summary of the chapter. So that means you're going to tell me the main important details, but not like every single little thing that happened. You're not going to rewrite the chapter. You're just going to tell me the main things that happened um, in order. So from what happened first to last. Um, and that should look about like a paragraph. It shouldn't be like three sentences. The chapter was a decent size. So you need to write a solid like fifth grade paragraph. So this is gonna take you a while, so don't rush. Um, I wanna see good fifth grade work like I know you can do since you're almost sixth graders. All right, and that's it for Wish.